Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Ian Morgan Cron, welcome back. It's good to connect again. Kerry, it is always a pleasure to hang out with you. And so we were chatting about retyping me. Am I a three or an eight? We may get to that at some point, but I want to start where we are. Last time you were on, we were a few months into the crisis. And honestly, I just never, you know, nobody knows what's coming until it happens. And here we are (laughs) a year and a bit later, and we're still in the midst of whatever we're in by the time this airs. There's not any easy relief in sight. And I would just love to know, um, you know, let's start personally. What's been the most surprising thing for you in this crisis so far, Ian? You know, uh, Initially, I would have said um, that um, how easy it was for me um, to deal with lockdown. Hmm. You know, like like in other words, as a like a four on the enneagram, the individualist, time alone to reflect, to read, to be creative. Uh, I'm I have a very strong introverted side. It 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 wasn't terribly hard in some ways in the beginning. Mm-hmm. But this year, now I live in Nashville, so we've, you know, here we've been through a horrible election. Mm-hmm. We went through uh, lots of civil uh, unrest. Uh, we here in Nashville went through a terrible tornado, uh, a big flood, um, COVID. Uh, I mean, just things started stacking up. Right. Hmm. And, and eventually I really got to the point that I was pretty darn, I I guess I didn't realize, honestly, and I came to the conclusion that I'm living in a traumatized country. Hmm. Like this whole country is traumatized. And I'm sure that that's the case to some degree in every country in the world, you know, but I, and I'm understanding the. I'm just beginning to think about, well, what are the long-term effects of that kind of trauma? On a on a on a country and on individuals, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Yeah, you know that's a really interesting observation. I think we're definitely at the cultural impact level. Like you and I, I mean, we're we're not twenty year olds anymore. But like you know, I, I think about my my uh, friends with young kids. You know, some of their children, it's like all of their life, half their life, a quarter of their life have been lived in pandemic, lockdown, perpetual crisis. You know, we've had a year plus now. So, you know, that's meaningful. If you live to be 100, one or 2% of your life was was lived in, in this kind of environment. And I think it's this cascading crisis business. We have our internal trauma, our internal struggles, but then all of this, like you're saying, natural disasters, racial injustice, political unrest, economic inequality, all of that is compiling and it shows up at a leader's door every single day. Mm-hmm. What, what have been helpful coping strategies for you and what have been unhelpful coping strategies for you? Well, you know, in terms of helpful ones, I, you know, as a therapist, I often, you know, uh, work with people who are pretty stressed. And as a consultant now with CEOs and corporate management teams, I'm dealing with a lot of stress they're dealing with. And it's pretty intense, right? <laughs> uh, given lockdown and working from home and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I pay attention to the details, Carrie. I, I, I really do. I believe in the basics. Um, you know, if, if someone, if a client comes in, let's say, or if CEO comes in, they're like, I'm just freaked out. I'm flipped out about this. They'll call it eight o'clock in the morning. I'll be like, okay. Um, what did you eat for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> There'll be silence on the other end of the phone. They're looking for some big existential answer. Right. And I'm like, what did you eat for breakfast? Oh, I, and I didn't have time for breakfast. Okay. How much water have you drunk today? I'll ask the question, when was the last time you exercised? And then I'll ask, how much sleep have you gotten in the past three nights? 
And, and a lot of times what, what I hear is two, three, four of them just haven't been addressed. And I'm like, tell you what, you do those four things and call me back. <laughs> and sometimes I'd say, I'd say seven out of 10 times they address those issues and their stress levels just go way down, you know, because mm-hmm. they're just not attending to the basics that we have human bodies that have requirements. And as you know, a lot of leaders um, live with the myth of invincibility. Yes. And they're just not invincible, right? They, they need water and food, sleep, exercise, fun. Uh, you know, I sometimes say to a leader, I'll go, when was the last time you, you went and just had fun? Like, screwed around, you know? And oh, I don't have time. It's like, well, if you don't have time for that, you don't have time to be a good leader, <laughs> you know? So that, so I attended the basics, right? I just, yeah. I attended the basics. And then, you know, I do stuff pretty, I mean, I meditate regularly. That's a very big spiritual practice for me. Uh, and I, I won't go into all the research on mindfulness meditation, but I'm a, I can just tell you, I'm a big believer, Yeah, big believer. Um, I try to foster healthy friendships. Hmm. That's important for me. I check in, you know, I'm part of a, you know, this, that I'm part of a 12 step recovery uh, yeah. group for people who've had chemical addictions for many years. I try to call three or four of my litter mates, as I like to call them, uh, <laughs> in that community every day. How are you every doing? Every day. Wow. On? Three or four. Every single day. Yeah. Maybe a five minute conversation. It's just a check in. You know, we, we, we have very serious bonds of friendship and commitment in those communities. And I sometimes I just have to get out of my own head and, and think about someone else's feelings for a few mm. minutes. You know, um, you know, I try to have a good sense of humor about stuff. And, uh, and frankly, I'm, I go to therapy every week. Wow. So I, you know, again, that's a long list, but, but I don't care. Like, you know, I'm not sure if we're going to get into Enneagram types here, but I don't care what type you are. Those things apply to every human being, all of them. So you got to invest in those things. If you want to properly manage long-term stress uh, or short-term stress for that matter. Yeah, I want to double click on a couple of those. So uh, this may be uh, a rabbit trail that's not worth going down, but you mentioned calling two or three friends a day. So here's something I've been thinking about a lot over the last few years and never really articulated or frankly talked to anybody about it. But there was a time, you know, you think back to our childhood, we're of similar vintage. Uh, People used to drop by, right? You think about Mm. your parents' house, friends would drop by. Then that stopped happening. It's just like people don't drop by anymore because people are too busy. Um, I had a a traveling salesperson knock on my door last month. I'm like, that happens once a year or once every three years. That used to be normal. But then this weird thing happened with phones, Ian, where you used to just call people all the time. It's like, I wonder what Ian's up to. I'll give him a call. And now it's like rude to call or you schedule a phone call. And that whole kind of spontaneous connection, like, my calendar, unless I'm really intentional about it, even with my friends, I feel like sometimes you have to schedule time. And I want you to speak into the impact of that. Whether you think there's anything there, like what is the value of just being able to say, hey, I'm just going to call my best friend right now. Or I'm going to call my buddy and see how he or she's doing. Okay, anything so there? I'm going to tell you the truth right now. I'm going to start laughing, but I call people all the time. Awesome. And I don't care. I don't care if they if they take offense or they, if they roll their eyes and I, and I'll tell them when, when I call them uh, and you know what else to do this is even worse time then um because I'm not satisfied just to hear their voice you know maybe it's my therapist side but I want to see their eyes I want to see the expression on their face you know I want to be able to know what's going on for real there you know I want to smile at them I want to, uh, or I want to, you know, let them see if I'm not in a good space, you know, that my face is downcast. You know, like I want to connect. Right. right? Um, and sometimes I'll text beforehand and I'll say, Hey man, you got time for a quick call. I did that t- twice this morning. It's like, mm. I am not satisfied with my machine talking to your machine. Yeah. Y- yeah. You know what I mean? I don't, I, I know don't, what you mean. I don't want I know what you two, mean, degrees man. Of, the, two degrees of separation between my glass and your glass. I, I want to relate to you. And I always tell people 
I did it yesterday. I always tell people, will you please feel free just to stop by my house and have a cup of coffee or tell me, let's go out for a cup of coffee, but, or let's sit on my porch and talk because I'm always looking for a distraction, you know? Mm. And so if you want to come sit on my porch for 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour or whatever, I love it. So to your point, I, uh, that's a long winded answer, but I do believe in the power of human um, face-to-face interpersonal contact. Hmm. And uh, I will take it any day of the week uh, over. And sometimes I kind of force my friends into it by saying, Hey, you know, let's, uh, let's not do just a call. Let's FaceTime. So you can do it anytime, Carrie. I'm going to do it to you. I'm just going to like, like bomb you. And I remember when it shifted about a decade ago or so. And so like you, I have a lot of young leaders who are listening. A lot of people, young leaders at the Typology podcast. I would love for you to speak to a leader in his or her 20s who goes, no, you text people. I don't even know that my phone has a phone. I don't call anybody. And I FaceTime, you know, once in a while and that kind of thing. But what are you missing when everything is scheduled. You are a therapist, you're a psychologist. So what, what, that's your background. That's what you do. What, what are we missing because we don't have that kind of spontaneous uh, face-to-face, voice-to-voice, drop-by-my-porch culture anymore? We're facing loneliness. That's what we're facing. And loneliness has reached epidemic proportions, and it's being widely reported on. I just was uh, reading a, a, a Harvard Business School uh, article the other day, and they, they spoke about the fact that in England, they now have a minister of loneliness. They actually have someone in their government who's trying to deal with the, prom- the problem of systemic and epidemic loneliness in the culture. Mm. Now, I don't know, but I bet you I could, you know, draw a line between when cell phone use and texting began and an increase in loneliness. I don't know if there's if there's some kind of a connection, but I would not be surprised if there was. There is. I mean, do you know um, the research of Jean Twenge from the, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, University of San Diego? I think she's going to be a guest on the show later this year. Uh, I just reached out to her. We're setting it up. She's done extensive research on the spike of anxiety in college-age students because she yes. teaches at University of San yes. Diego and the first digital generation. Yes. And she draws a direct line, not a dotted line, not a, mm, we think. It's like, no, there's a direct spike in digital nativeness and the rise in anxiety and depression. Well, and part of that is, is that we receive more news information from around the world than we are capable of processing or digesting. Yes. So, you know, when when you, you know, when I was a kid, you read the New York Times and there were like five headlines, you know, (laughs) they didn't tell you about uh, the outbreak of some small thing going on in Myanmar, not Myanmar, but you know, it's a big deal. But I mean, like in Papua New Guinea, you know, it's like there are disasters coming at us from everywhere. Bad news coming at us from everywhere. Um, and of course, you know, clickbait headlines, uh, their, their job is to scare the bejesus out of you so you'll read it. I mean, there's just a lot of stress in the, in, the, in the, and you know what? I don't think the human mind and heart is designed to cope with that much information. It's overwhelming. It's too much. No wonder, you're, no wonder we're anxious and depressed. I agree with that. I really do. Because, you know, you and I have the the good fortune of having a pre-digital memory. I remember when it was newspapers. Uh-huh. Um, we're old enough to remember three networks, four networks, right? And basically, you kind of got it. News was in a half hour. Now, every time you look at your phone, something's blowing up. Someone's blowing up. Something's bad. People are trying to get your attention. And, you know, the majority of listeners to this show wouldn't remember a world where that wasn't the case. What are what are some strategies in your mind for coping with that or handling that? Because I find sometimes for me, it's like, yeah, I'm not looking at the news anymore. I don't watch TV anymore. Um, I really limit my, new, my news consumption to what I need to know. Try not to make, you know, the doom scrolling thing a part of my life. But it, it's hard to keep it out because it's just you're bombarded 24-7. Yeah. Well, I mean, one is, is I am... Uh, I spent in, 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 
I mean, I shouldn't, but I guess, but I spent virtually no time on social media, mm. especially Twitter, which is sort of the outrage channel. You know, I, I just, you know, after a while, I'm like, oh my gosh, all these people who think I should be interested in their outrage. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit like, ah, it's just too much anxiety and rage for me. Um, and then, of course, you know, I mean, Instagram has its, you know, problems, uh, sort of anxiety producing or envy producing problems yeah. when envy, you know, leads to, you know, uh, feelings of, of comparison and then inferiority, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I spend very little time on it. I go through periods where I get a little trapped in new stuff in the morning, but typically, you know, I, I glance at the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and maybe CNN. But, mm. but, but, you know, I read the headlines and I'm like, golly, you're clickbaiting me. And yeah. it, it just, it starts to annoy me. Um, and so I, I do try and, and be self-disciplined around those things. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I, 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 again, like I said, I just don't think I'm capable of coping mm. with that much information without be feeling like I'm drowning. Like I'm just drowning. And I, I just don't think that's, that's any way to live. And, but we do have to deal with our, that this is a real addiction problem. So, yeah. you know, and technology is set up to create addicts, right? Mm. So, you know, it's, it's discouraging at times, you know, but we can, we can come up with good disciplines for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, compassion fatigue is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, right? Like when I get overwhelmed by international problems, and some of them are truly tragic, but you know, there's a lot of uh, trivia there and clickbait and the whole deal. And then when you have an actual crisis, sometimes your um, compassion doesn't function the way it's supposed to function. It doesn't behave the way it's supposed to behave. Um, from your training and your experience, any any thoughts on compassion fatigue and how to deal with it? And then I want to talk about meditation because we skipped over it quickly, but I want to come back to it. Well, good, because it actually meditation will tie in beautifully to this topic of compassion. Mm. Okay. You know, uh, it's no wonder we have compassion fatigue. We have, it's no wonder we have it because when you are watching this, the, these many catastrophe, catastrophes every single day, I mean – if you felt too much compassion all the time, you, you're going to run out. And after a while, it becomes so commonplace, yeah. you know, that, that you're like, okay, there it is again. I mean, it's like, yeah. and 20 shootings on the weekend. Of helplessness. Like, yeah. Well, and after a while, you, you have this feeling of helplessness, right? It's like, what can I do? Well, there are too many crises. I don't even know which one to pick. You know, it's, it's so, so again, there's this feeling of helplessness, powerlessness, and when you're, you know, you develop learned helplessness, it's like you're, you're just like a, a dog in a cage being poked with a stick and it'll bark the first 10 times you do that. But after a while, it just lays there, mm. you know, when you continue to do it, it just gives up. Mm. And I think, I think that's what can happen to us with compassion. Now let's talk about meditation. What's your yeah, question? Yeah. So uh, what's your practice? What does it look like? What are the benefits? Yeah. Every morning I get up, I have a, I go to my cushion. I have my meditation cushion. Uh, I've been doing this for many years. Uh, I sit uh, for 20 to 25 minutes in silent meditation. And uh, I use a basic mindfulness practice, which is sitting on it's, I mean, meditation is so simple. We make it hard. So I, mm. I can just tell you right now, there's no guru kind of magic to this thing. You sit down on the cushion, you quiet the mind, you bring your attention uh, to your breath. And you follow your breath. And when your mind uh, becomes distracted by thoughts, which it will, thoughts aren't bad. We just secrete them like, you know, the thyroid glands, you know, secretes enzymes or whatever. And we just smile at them and bring our attention back to, to the breath, right? And so it's, it's a training of the mind. And one of the, re what the research has shown, I mean, from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, from Stanford, from countless places, uh, that regular mindfulness meditation elevates compassion, empathy, uh, and uh, feelings of, of well-being and connectedness, uh, among other things. And, and I'm, 
I have seen that in my life. When I fall out of my meditation practice for some reason, the discipline of it, I have a, I feel it. And when I'm doing it, there's a palpable, I'm a, I'm a different person when I'm regularly meditating. Hmm. I mean, I, and when, and then I go, why did I stop for two weeks? I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, this is something I don't ever want to lose. Why do you think that is? I think a lot of us have heard about the benefits of meditation. It's part of the Christian tradition. It's part of a lot of spiritual mm-hmm. traditions. What do you think, like, I, I know what it is, and I think a lot of listeners would know what it is, but why do you think it's so powerful? Well, there's some, I mean, re- remember too that mindfulness, uh, there are many, many people who would call themselves atheists who have mindfulness practices. Totally. yeah. You know, because there's a science behind it. I mean, there's a mm. reason why in the Christian tradition, the Buddhist tradition, other traditions like it, that, that people gravitated toward it, it's because it works, that we knew it before the scientists did. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and so it's, it's uh, the science says that, you know, what happens in meditation is there's a kind of rewiring of your neural pathways. And, and we, we now know that, that um, routine patterns of, let's say, negative thinking or judgmentalism, things like that can be softened and changed, rewired. So mindfulness meditation uh, has the capacity to, and it's, it's uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I, I'm always telling people, start at five minutes and do that until you think you're ready for seven. And then go to seven. If you do that for two weeks and that's all you got, okay, fine. Then do it for two weeks. Then go to 10. You know, I mean, just, I didn't go to 20 and 25 minutes. I got there in 20, 20 years, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. where I can do 25 or 30 minutes. And in a group, I can do it. I, but, but in a group, I can do an hour. That's, that's not, I mean, it's a little bit easier for me in community than it is alone, but I can do a full hour with a community. Why is that? How is that? Why is community longer? I just feel so. I think a lot of, and this is not, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's unique to me. I, I think when you're in a community, there's a sort of a, a sense of support that, uh, uh, you know, that you feel in the room. We're, we're, we, we are all doing this together. And we feel sort of connected and supported in the time of meditation. Um, and, you know, uh, that's why I think it's easier. What happens when, because um, they do happen, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say prayer, but not meditation. I, I want to try it more um, because I think it has tremendous benefits. But you're right. You get derailed by all these thoughts that come in and I got this to do. And oh my goodness, I forgot about that. What, what do you do with those interruptions? It's That's why we call it a practice. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to grab, grab my iPad or a piece of paper and write it all down, right? So, uh, but you don't. Yeah, well... No, 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 no. It, it, but again, it's again, it's so simple. We make it hard, and it. But it is difficult, you know. Mm-hmm. To quiet the mind uh, is is a difficult task. Uh, but it's it's really crucial. It's so crucial. It, it also developed what I call equanimity, um, which is the quality of being able to cope and respond rather than react to whatever life happens to throw at you Mm. in a given moment. You know, like when I have a regular practice going and the crap hits the fan, I'm much, it's much easier for me to be, to stay calm and respond rather than go right into reactivity and do really dumb stuff. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) You know what I mean? Just, you know, say dumb stuff, make stupid decisions, uh, you know, have to apologize to three people, whatever. It, you know, I'm just a more centered and grounded and in not control, but in a, in a place of where I'm able to really live that first part of the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference and to, you know, and just be, okay. Okay. So this let's do, let's deal with this. And it's not, you know, I, I, I just live with more emotional wisdom when I have, uh, you know, a regular meditation practice. And, and so for Christians, by the way, where I recommend them to go is to really learn about centering prayer. 
Uh, mm. And Centering Prayer, if they went to Father Thomas Keating, I think it's centeringprayer.org, if I remember. Okay. Uh, a, a Catholic priest who's been uh, sort of a pioneer uh, of Centering Prayer, which is essentially a mindfulness practice. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, it's a Christian mindfulness practice. And so for some Christians, that feels more safe. You know, if they're slightly anxious about the word meditation, which I think is a silly thing to be, considering it's been a big part of our history, I think it's silly, but hey, you know. Well, considering it's Old Testament, New Testament, that's not (laughs) that much of a stretch. Yeah. If if you need it to be centering prayer, that's fine with me. Just do it. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Ian, you, you interact with thousands of leaders every year, maybe more, and you're talking to them on a regular basis. So here we are a full year and a bit into the crisis. What are the presenting issues? We kind of touched on it a little bit already, but if there's anything more there, I'd like to go there. What are the presenting issues? What are the, what are the challenges leaders are facing in this moment now that we're in a period of chronic stress, uncertainty, anxiety, and um, unresolved crisis? Yeah, I mean, one is to a point I just made. You know, is how do how do you respond instead of react? Um, how how do you begin to answer the question? What does this crisis make possible right now? Versus how do I get things to go back to what they used to be like? <laughs> well, you need to give that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that that's the wrong question. It's always the wrong question. The the real question is always. All right, so what does this, okay, so here's a prayer I often say, right? God, um, what is your will for my life in this situation over which I have no control? Mm. And mm. that's a really great prayer in any given moment. That's a responding that prayer. Is. Not, that's how you respond to crisis. You go, all right, God, what is your will for my life in this situation over which I have no control? Okay. And who has control over the pandemic? Who has control over, you know, uh, what the uh, unemployment is like and and a volatile economy and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But but to step back and go, okay, what what is God's will for me in this situation? Over which, and this is important, Hmm. over which I have no control because that's an illusion. I mean, control is an illusion. Yeah. Right. That people would like, because they get anxious, they like to think they're more in control of life than they are, right? So accepting powerlessness is actually the, the greatest source of power we have, mm. ironically. You know, embrace your powerlessness. And when you do that, you find power, right? It's true. That's just a, that's just a spiritual principle uh, in general of the universe. So that's one thing. I think another thing that leaders are facing is, you know, in the midst of, I mean, so many changes and uncertainties uh, in the future is, you know, how do I continue to lead rather than fall into the, the pitfall of micromanagement? Mm. When, when people panic, they, they stop leading and they go down into the weeds. It's almost like a reflex. It's like they got to start micromanaging detail instead of saying, no, if if there's ever been a time when I need to lead and not micromanage, it's right now, you know, uh, but that's the, that's the temptation, right? Is when, you know, is to get down the weeds and, and like start dealing with stuff that is really the business of other people. And you need to stay, leaders need to stay at a hundred thousand feet, okay. not go down to 10,000 and, and get involved in the minutia of whatever the organization is that they're leading, because that's always a temptation, mm-hmm. right? You know, uh, get, it's to get too involved in stuff that's really not best for you to be involved in. How do you stay out of that as a, as a leader yourself? Are, are you tempted to go there into micromanagement? Because when you say that, I, I've learned that that is one of my responses to stress is like, totally. now I'm going to get all in the details. So how do you keep yourself from that when you see yourself going there, if you do? Well, I, again, I mentioned meditation again, because my- yeah. Meditation helps me to be self-aware and to, what it does is it, it, it develops an inner observer in me that's able to stand back and catch myself in the act of doing mm. things I ought not be doing. It prevents me from living on autopilot. I, I'm able to step back and say, oh, this feeling of stress is coming up and I feel 
like I want to get, you know, become critical and wanted to see things, you know, she, you know, reports and things like that, that, you know, really aren't for me to look at. I just need to step back and let people do what, what they're supposed to do. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do and, and discipline myself to stay at, at a higher level um, looking down the road instead of, you know, getting too trapped in uh, what's happening in, in this present moment. You know, it's, it's all anxiety management. Hmm. You know? Yeah, it kind of is, isn't it? It kind yeah. of is, especially in a chronic stage. I mean, you can get through a bad week and get through a bad month, but when this becomes your life, it's a, it's a different story. All right. I do want to open this up to the Enneagram because that is where you have spent uh, a lot of your life and, and uh, what a lot of leaders know you for. And this is a really broad question. So feel free to take it wherever you want, Ian, because this is your wheelhouse. But uh, what does the Enneagram have to teach us about this season that we are all in? Well, so much. But I mean, one of the gifts of the Enneagram is, is that once you know your type, it, it's able to reveal to you what you will probably begin to act, think, and feel like when you're under stress. Hmm. And when you're able to recognize that pattern arising in your life to make new choices, it gives you the freedom to make new choices in the face of stress. Like, you know, uh, as a four, I know that I start to look like an unhealthy two when I'm under stress. And when I spot those patterns emerging in my life, I'll go, "Uh uh-oh. I see where this is going and I can choose to make new, uh, to to approach things differently, to make new choices than uh, I used to make before I understood my type. Right. Be on autopilot. I would just go there. You know, I'd go back and swing at the same old pitch and strike out every (laughs) single time. That might be a fun place to camp for a little while. If you're up to it, do you mind taking us through the nine types, which will cover all the leaders? Give us a quick summary of what they are and where we go when we're unhealthy, because that's one part of the Enneagram. I'm not like I haven't got top of mind myself personally. I kind of kind of have a rough idea, but I would love to know. So, you know, let we can start with ones and, you know, give a brief thumbnail. And then, hey, when ones are stressed, here's what they do. They go to this. That that would be that would be worth camping on, I think. All right. So we're gonna have to do it real quick. I'm like, so I'm only gonna give thumbnail sketches. Okay? okay. Super, super fast. Ones are are called, I call them the improvers. They used to be called the perfectionists, but I, I stopped calling them that because uh they would say to me, you know, like, why am I the only type whose whose signifier is, you know, is so negative or pejorative sounding? You know, well, uh, I would so, argue that the challenger actually is more pejorative, but that's okay. That's me. Well, you know, I'm I'm not so sure if it is, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, what it feels like to me. Anyway, yeah, so I, number one the, is improver. Yeah, the improver. So these are people who who have a need to perfect themselves, uh, the all that they do, others, and the world. Okay, when a one is under stress, they start to look like an unhealthy four. Okay. And, and what that means is they, um, their inner critic begins to work overtime. Mm. Their need to perfect the world goes into overdrive. Um, they might become more resentful of people uh, who are having more fun than they are, mm. right? Are not as concerned as they are with uh, you know perfecting the world. They'll become more sensitive to criticism and depressed. And it, they'll start to long to be free of obligations and responsibilities and perhaps feel a little unlovable. Mm-hmm. Mm. So that's where, that's where ones will, will often go in, in stress. Twos in stress, they start to look like an unhealthy eight. Uh, they'll become demanding. And two's a helper, right? Two's a helper. Two's are the helpers. They have a need. Actually, no, I'll make it real simple for you. Twos have a need to be liked. Mm. They just really want to be liked. They want to be uh, liked, appreciated and approved of. And when uh, in the strategy for winning that love and approval is really giving and giving to others and helping to meet the needs of others. So there, there's a little bit in an, for an un, not a very self-aware too, there's a little bit of calculated giving. Hmm. It's like, if I give to you in return, you will uh, 
give to me. And, and what I'm looking for is your approval, your appreciation, your liking me. And also meeting my personal needs without my ha having to directly come, out, come right out and ask for it. Hmm. Right. But when they're not doing great, they start to look not so great eights. They become demanding. They can become controlling, aggressive. Um, they will blame other people uh, for what's making them unhappy and uh, sometimes even vengeful uh, about past wrongs. So wow. that's, what a, that's where a two can go. They can also get in this space where it's like uh, this sort of res martyry, resentful thing where it's a little bit like, I'm always there for other people, but when I have needs, no one comes to my aid. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like I know exactly what a, you mean. Yeah. You know, yeah. So okay, that's, so that that's a two. two. Threes, yeah, threes performers, they have a need to succeed, to appear successful, and to avoid failure at all costs, okay? When they get stressed, they, they start to take on the characteristic behaviors of unhealthy nines, and they'll kind of retreat to the couch with the remote, you know? Uh, they may get lost in unproductive, busy work. Um, they'll be kind of worn out. They lose their characteristic optimism and confidence, and they become a little more self-doubtful than they normal, normally are. Hmm. Um, they might lose interest in working out or eating healthy foods and paying attention to their appearance. And uh, uh, so there's this kind of um, a weary edge to that unhealthy three, you know? Um, and uh, so I, you know, I can tell when a three is down, feeling stressed, man. They, they, they're just, they don't bring the juice like they normally do, mm. you know. So I, I would say with fours, the individualists, um, people, these are people who I think really want to find a place of belonging in the world. Mm. They, they feel like they, they're missing something important in their essential makeup that everybody else seems to have. Uh, and you know, uh, that creates in them a sense of inferiority and it launches them on a quest to find whatever it is inside that is missing that they, mm. everyone else seems that, and they, they tend to envy other people's normalcy and happiness. And, and there's this kind of feeling of I'm a misfit kind of a quality to them, you know? Um, uh, and you know, that's why we, we have so many artists who are or a lot of great music and films and, and poetry comes out of that, that feeling, you know, mm. uh, that feeling space, that melancholy that fours are, are often for. And when they get into a bad space, they start to look like uh, an unhealthy too. They become excessively dependent on other people. They crave attention. They'll need a lot of reassurance and, and affirmation from their friends and their partners. And jealousy might surface, you know. Mm. Um, you want me to give you an example of this? Yeah, I would love you to. Okay, so I'm a four. Now yeah. I'm a particular subtype of a four. We're known as the sunny four. So I'm a, I'm not as melancholy as the stereotype four. Okay. And um, I was, uh, I'm an Episcopal priest. I'm celebrating the Eucharist at, a, at an Easter mass. And uh, I happened to notice that in the front row, there was a guy wearing a seersucker suit standing next to his eight year old, wearing an identical seersucker suit and identical bow ties arm around each other, just singing and smiling. All right. Now I see those two kids, those two people. And, you know, and I, I look at them and of course I had, you know, I had this a terrible relationship with a, a father who died from alcoholism. Mm. And I looked at him and suddenly I just felt this sense of envy come up like, Oh, melancholy and envy. What if I'd had that kind of a relationship mm. with my dad? And now because I have enough self-awareness, I mean, I'm not going to pat myself on the back, but I've done a lot of work on this stuff. And I just was able to stop. My inner observer was able to step back and observe it. And I went, you know, it's Easter, right? <laughs> 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 you know, it's that whole resurrection thing, promise of new life. And I'm like, do you really want to go there on Easter? I mean, seriously, this is the day we're singing Christ the Lord is risen today. How about you join him? <laughs> <laughs> and then I kind of laughed at myself and I moved on. Right. But that's where, that's where that four can go when they're under stress. You know, we become, you know, that envy can arise and, and feelings of lesser than, and why didn't, you know, what if, and, you know, thinking a lot about suffering in the past. And it's like, under stress, when I start to go there, I now know, like, that's an old story, man. If you want to live in that story, you go ahead, but 
you know, as far as I can tell, God has a new story for you, brother. Hmm. You know? So, all right, moving That's on. Powerful. Investigators. Man, when fives. A, when a, fives. I love fives, man. Oh, I'm married fives. to one. Yeah. Uh, aren't they the best? Mm-hmm. When they're healthy, man, I love fives. Fives, fives are, are really um, people who are motivated by uh, a need to conserve what they perceive are limited resources, particularly for relationships. They feel very mm-hmm. depleted and drained when they're around people too much. Um, they are motivated uh, by uh, a need to gather knowledge and information to fend off what to them feels like an, uh, a really overwhelming and draining world, yeah. you know? And, um, and how do they do that? Right. It's this, you know, they, they, they become sort of information junkies. They, they just, they, they just can't stop learning. And, and, and that gives them a sense that, you know, knowledge is power. And so that right. gives them a sense of power. Now, when they're not doing great, they start to look like unhealthy sevens. Um, hmm. And that's really something to behold. They, they become uh, disorganized, distracted uh, to the point that they're not able to complete tasks. You know, they, they sort of have word salads. They're normally very, very articulate and they can, they're very linear and analytical in their thinking. And suddenly things get disconnected and ideas are coming out right and left. You know, it's hard to follow what they're saying. Um, but they, you know, they can also, if they're not careful in that space, become a little rude, a little condescending and emotionally mm-hmm. more distant than usual. Um, you're nodding your head like that sounds oh, right. I recognize all these patterns and she will recognize mine when we get to them. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, okay, so totally. sixes, the loyalists. These people are motivated by a need to feel safe, secure, and supported. And what to them feels like a very dangerous, uh, unpredictable world. Hmm? Mm. Now, when sixes aren't great, doing great, they go to the low side, the negative side of three, right? The performer, where they can become workaholics who are, you know, looking for material success or hoarding resources. Why? Why would they choose to like chase after success? Because it would make them feel more secure. Ah, uh, that like okay. a, right? Yeah. So in that space, sixes are, are, this is interesting. Sixes are some of the most truthful, honest people I know, but in, when they're under stress, they are more inclined to misrepresent themselves and project an image of competency hmm. to fend off their own anxiety and to give others the impression that they have it all together like an unhealthy three would right do, do you see where i'm this is the totally. same for every number so uh and why because it's gonna fend off anxiety uh that they live sixes typically have a lot of anxiety i gotta right? tell you and your your uh, description of sixes both in our conversations but also in the road back to you has given mm-hmm. me such an appreciation of sixes because it is that mm-hmm. mildly critical. I never knew how to read that personality type, that mildly critical 20 questions, 100 questions on the front end. But then when they're bought in, they're like loyal for life. And yeah. you you believe, your theory is that that is the largest percentage of the population, probably. You know, or it's purely chunk. speculative. Not, 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 yeah. not like the majority. It's a meaningful but like, chunk, but, but it, that's speculation. You know, a lot of yeah. teachers, Enneagram teachers will say, we think there are more sixes than any other type represented in the population and probably fewer four than, mm. than in the population than any other type. Uh, for which but you I've identified many others- sixes in my life and I appreciate them more than ever because they were always a puzzle and I couldn't figure out why are you so critical but then so loyal? Like, oh, I get well, it. So be careful with using the word critical. Okay. I, I would say that the more questioning and uh um they're the first people to spot what could go wrong in a plan okay you're right or or a project and and they'll and they'll you know if you're the leader and you got a six on your team you present a plan they're the first person to say yeah but have you thought through what would happen if this happened or that happened or this happened or that happened and it's and you may feel like golly man this guy is so pessimistic i definitely feel that way or he's so paranoid. Uh, and if you say to a six, stop being such a pessimist, they'll get right up on you and go, I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. And you're up in the, you're an idealist, but you're in the clouds. You have not thought through what will happen to cash flow in the third quarter. If you go forward with this plan, mm-hmm. I can see the problem. You cannot see the problem. And, and you'll feel like they're critical or, you know, pushing back on your leadership. No, 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 no. They want to know what they're supposed to do should something go wrong. 
So they're going to keep pushing you to find out, have you thought through all the contingencies? And if you answer all their questions and you have prepared for what could go wrong, they will follow you off a cliff. They will support you to the very end. Mm. But if you haven't thought it through, man, they're going to be like, I don't know. So helpful. So I don't helpful. know about following this. Guy. I want to get my 30s back because I think I alienated a lot of sixes, Ian. <laughs> oh. Oh, man. I, I'd like to get my 30s back. If I knew then what I know now, I'd, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't even want to think about it. Anyway, um, it's the enthusiasts. Uh, these are people who are motivated by a need to avoid psychological and emotional pain. Hmm? Mm. And uh, they do that by uh, hotly pursuing um, fun, happiness, uh, future escapades, adventures, uh, interest by pursuing interesting ideas, uh, sampling everything that life has to offer them so that in the, they don't have to be in the present moment where things like stuck and boredom and routine and sadness or grief or discomfort might be. They can live in this, this future of unlimited possibilities all the time, hmm. right? Uh, the future always has something it contained in it that this moment cannot give you, right? True. So now when a seven's not doing great, they will start to look like uh, they're a, sort of a, an unhealthy one, and they'll become pessimistic, judgmental, argumentative. They'll take the moral high ground. Hmm. Uh, they'll start blaming others uh, for their problems, and they'll lapse into black and white thinking. So. That's something that, you know, sevens uh, just have to be aware of. My son went to boarding school and uh, sometimes he would call me on the phone. He would say, you know, I don't like any of the kids on my floor. They slow pot and, and they're just not respectful. And I'll go like this. Is it exam time? <laughs> because I, I know what's happening is he's, he's, he's taking the moral high ground. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just saying he, he has suddenly become focused on, on those sorts of things and becoming kind of... Um, yeah, judgmental, critical, and a little self-righteous indignation starts to bust out, you know? Um, <laughs> all right, eights. All right, let's talk about eights. Uh, when you guys are not doing great, um, well, first of all, you're the challenger. You're motivated by a need to assert power and strength over the environment and others in order to mask vulnerability, mm -hmm. okay? Now, when eights get stressed out, they move to and take on the qualities that you would associate with an unhealthy five. Okay. Uh, here, they you you you'll withdraw and become even less connected to your emotions, mm. and uh, you might experience insomnia. You may neglect to take care of yourself. You may not eat correctly or exercise right. Uh, you'll become more secretive, hyper vigilant about betrayal, and you also may dig your heels in and become even more uncompromising than usual. Yes. Right. Uh, and that's not a great space for eights, you know, you, you, and you'll withdraw, which is very unusual for eights. M normally, eights assert when they want something, they go and get it. Fives tend to withdraw when they're not in a great space and they go into themselves to find what they need. They don't and to get what they want. Y you go out and get it right mm. pretty aggressively. Right. All right. Nines. Last number um, in, in stress. Nines start to act like unhealthy sixes. And they become overcommitted, worried, rigid, wary of others, more anxious, and may not know why, right? Um, they'll become more self-doubting than usual, which, which makes decision-making even more difficult. And they'll become uh, reactive, and, mm. which is uh, a, a sort of a big departure for a number that is rarely, if ever, quick to react. So... That's the, that's the nine types. And just a thumbnail. I could say a ton more about what they're like under stress, but that's just a, a sample of what, what some of those types will do. Well, that's so helpful. And you and I have an open dialogue right now about whether I'm an eight or a three, because my wife, Tony, and I did an interview for your typology podcast. And at the end, you were like, hey, are you sure you're an eight? Are you a three? And so I imagine there's some listeners here who are like, Ian, I'd, I'd love to know which one I am. Um, tell them how they can figure it out. Well, <clears throat> they can read my book, The Road Back to You. That would be mm -hmm. helpful. They can I've handed it out so many times to people, and Thank it's so you helpful. Thank you very much. 
I thank you and Brown University. Thanks you for paying my son's tuition. Uh, <laughs> you can um, go to ianmorgancron.com, I-A-N-M-O-R-G-A-N, uh, C-R-O-N.com, and you can take my IEQ9 Enneagram assessment. All right, that would be another possibility. Listen to my podcast, Typology, uh, on which I really I speak to people of all types uh, and try to get to hear what it's like to live in their shoes and to see the world through their eyes. And that also is very helpful to people when they identify with different types. And um, obviously, you know, check out my Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter feed at Ian Morgan Cron. And, I, you know, you'll learn tons about what I'm up to. And I like what you say too about um, just paying attention to like giving yourself some time, read the book, maybe do the assessment, live in it a little bit, see what mm-hmm. works. It took you like a long time to figure out what you were and you teach this stuff. Yeah. Um, I would love to know just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, talked about getting healthy. What are you most concerned about for leaders moving forward? It does seem like we're moving into an unstable time or season. So what what is worrisome to you or what are you focused on as we head into the future, Ian? Well, you know, I think I've covered some of it in, mm-hmm. in the conversation, which is, you know, helping them to live in a space of responding versus reacting to what's happening. Yeah. Um, and uh, also to avoid slipping into management mode versus leadership mode, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, most leaders have good managers underneath them. Let them, let them, let them do their job and uh, don't frustrate them by, you know, getting into their grills about stuff, you know, stay, stay at the level of mission of vision of, you know, f- looking down the road and forecasting what's coming. Um, that's the sort of thing that I think is important. I, and, you know, another thing we spoke about, that I think is very important for leaders is to make sure that they, that they're to really self-examine and ask themselves the question, am I lonely? Because obviously loneliness is a big issue for leaders. And, and, and what's interesting about right now that's happened is that I've been reading some articles and talking with leaders is they've been calling CEOs of companies they compete with. And because, you know, they, they have ambivalent relationships, but they, most of them know each other, right? Yeah. And they're asking each other, what are you doing within the pandemic? Like, how are you handling this? And what are you, you know, they're like sharing notes with each other. And I think part of that's reflective, not only of, you know, I need help. It's also a reflection of, I'm kind of lonely out here. Yeah. And uh, I think leaders have to be very cautious of loneliness. Mm. Really cautious. Can you tell me why? What, what, what happens when you're lonely? Well, um, human beings are social creatures. And uh, when, when we get lonely, we start to feel isolated. Uh, we start to live in what I call an epistemic cocoon, which mean which meaning that uh, we get trapped in in uh, only hearing uh, our own viewpoints and perspectives, and we we lose the opportunity to bounce them off of other people and to hear alternative ways of seeing the world and reacting to the world. And you know what? Our hearts just need it. You know, we 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 have a deep need for human connection. It's just a it's just a fact. I mean, the research, it's not even like, it's not a spiritual opinion, although it is, Um, you know, it's not good for men or women to be alone, (laughs) you know, to borrow an idea. I mean, and (laughs) and tweak it a little bit, but I just think it's, I just think it's true. I mean, let's talk about it from a Christian perspective. God is a community. Hmm. He's three, right? I mean, it's like we, we, uh, our God has a social component. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think we have to pay attention that, uh, that this, this is the case, you know, like we, we're built for relationship, for community, and uh, we desperately need it for good health, mental health. Yeah. So random phone calls, FaceTime calls, connection with friends. For leaders yeah. who feel isolated, and this is becoming a recurring theme on the podcast, but I'd love to get your take on it. They're like, okay, Ian, thank you. I'm all alone. Um, I have I have burned some bridges. I'm cut off. I don't feel comfortable. You know, there's nobody I could really call right now. And that, according to like people like Henry Cloud and others, is actually the 
almost default position for most leaders. If you really get under the hood, most of us are lonely. And what would you say they should do? Well, don't, they need to stop flattering themselves. If they think, you know, uh, you know, you know, I really, um, I burned too many bridges, as you said, or I'm, you know, you know, what you just described as somebody yeah. who has a pretty high opinion of their, of their badness, you know what I mean? <laughs> or their, their unworthiness of relationship. I mean, you know, I mean, they, you know, they have to cultivate more emotional wisdom. I mean, they could read Daniel Goleman's book on emotional intelligence. I mean, That's they just book. have to learn how to be with people in the world. You know, leaders have to learn how to be vulnerable. You know, oftentimes leaders can conf- confuse vulnerability with weakness. And that's a big mistake, man. You know, uh, they've learned that in business, it's like, you know, I remember one CEO saying to me, hey, you know what? If you want to play in the NFL, you got to expect you'll be hit, you know? And he was like being a tough guy about it, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Here's another one of these guys who doesn't know how to be vulnerable. And he thinks that in vulnerability, being a hard, you know, being a hard ass all the time is courage. And I'm like, that ain't courage, man. That's hmm. cowardice. Vulnerability is courage. Vulnerability is what requires courage, not defendedness, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and vulnerability is arguably the most important ingredient in forging great relationships. So I would tell leaders, work on vulnerability of many things. I would say to them, you want to have relationships, start practicing vulnerability. I think one of the things you told me once, and this may have been on a podcast, so people can listen back, but I would love you to underscore it. And um, if, if it's incorrect in my memory, let me know. But I believe you you made a distinction between vulnerability and transparency. Oh. Does that, does that resonate at all? Yeah. Because you said, Carrie, I think you said, Carrie, you're being transparent, but not vulnerable. Can you, can you explain what the difference is? Yeah. And, and I would even say, just for our sake today, I'd yeah. talk about what I call strategic transparency. <laughs> Okay. You know, I remember, you know, there was a period in the church, you know, when you'd go and you'd hear some pastor, but it was outside of the church too, when everyone was talking about quote unquote authenticity. Yeah. You know, we want to be an authentic church. I want to be an authentic pastor. And I'm, you know, as a pastor, you know, I'm a, I was a pastor and I'm, I'm a therapist. You know, whenever I hear people saying, I just, I want to be authentic. I'm usually like, you understand, don't you? That when you try to be authentic, you're automatically being inauthentic. You're, you're, you're. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, right? I know what you mean. And, yeah. and, and so you sometimes I'll hear people talk and there's this kind of strategic transparency. It's like, I want to tell you about my, you know, I have this addiction or I have this, right? Mm. You know, and it's a little bit like I get the sense that that just feels a little bit like strategic transparency. Like, like you're kind mm. of taking a shortcut and making it sound like vulnerability, but it's not really. Mm. I know I'm being vulnerable when... Um, I share somebody something with somebody and I sweat mm. or I might get choked up or the hair on the back of my neck stands up or I really worry this person might abandon me if I tell them this, this thing about myself, <laughs> which has rarely ever happened. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that fear comes up to me. That's sort of a tell. That's sort of the tell that I'm being vulnerable. Right. And so, I, you know, sometimes I hear what, what I call strategic transparency and it kind of drives me crazy because it's, you know, I think it's unconscious on the person's part, but frankly, at its worst, it's, it's kind of manipulative. Mm. It, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you kind of get this sense like, oh, you're trying to create this sense of, you know, of making a connection with me when actually this is not really what's happening here, you know, uh, and, uh, and smart people can smell it usually. Right. You know, right. Um, that feels like it feels a little bit like an act. And if you're an eight, like I am, that, that is a little bit harder than it is for other types. Is that fair? Is that true? Well, it would be harder for you because you have no tolerance for it. I mean, uh, you, you, you are somebody who, um, you can smell deception a hundred miles away. Oh, yeah, totally. I say right? that to people I'm with. I'm like, that guy's yeah. lying. I can tell. Yeah. I mean, you like, can smell it and you mm. can smell a, a poser. 
you you don't have much time for it. <laughs> don't get so me started. So if you get the sense that somebody's kind of like trying to work you, yeah, you're like, mm, I don't know. This guy seems like he's got another agenda here. This, you know, it's like I'm feeling an ulterior motive behind all this sharing. And I know that it's, <laughs> you know, listen, I don't want to be, I don't want to be too cynical here. Yeah. I want people to understand, to discern, I want leaders to discern the difference between strategic transparency and vulnerability. Hmm. You know, uh, it, I don't want leaders to become stupidly vulnerable. There's, you know, there's places. Yeah, to yeah. Approach. You shouldn't share you with everybody. A, Right. Yeah. No, no, you want to be appropriately vulnerable to this person in the situation. You know, mm. I don't tell my kids the deepest secrets of my heart. It's not appropriate. <laughs> they, they can't really, it's not appropriate. Right. I mean, I will with my wife. Mm. Right. I, I will with, you know, very, very few people. You have to be very, you have to be, again, discernment's the rule here. Be discerning. Right. Yes. But a good leader is vulnerable enough with his or her team. If they're not like for an eight, that you know, vulnerability does not. You have to really be more. I can be vulnerable in a heartbeat, brother. You mm. have a lot more trouble with vulnerability than I do. It's it's a learned right? skill. No, it's not a learned skill. It's a learned habit. It's not a skill. Right. It's a it's a practice of mine that I have become more and more comfortable with over the years. Right. And when you do it appropriately with your team, they then feel comfortable sharing their weaknesses and vulnerabilities with you. Otherwise, they will see you as Teflon and something they can never live up to. And they'll view you as potentially being someone who's unsafe. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm not going to share with he's not going to. I mean, there's kind of a little bit of mutuality that happens for real vulnerability to the benefits of vulnerability to bust out. So. Oh, Ian, once again, so rich. I know this is a continuing conversation on this show and I know it won't be the last round, but just thank you so much for serving to lead with our leaders today. Any, any final thoughts, anything you want to leave leaders with as we move into this rather wobbly future, as far as we can see anyway? Yeah. Well, um, every morning uh, I say four prayers, Okay. And I'll just tell you one of them and then go look it up. And I don't, by the way, you could do this prayer, even if you're not a Christian, I don't care. You, it is one of those prayers of intention, if you want it to be, or, you know, a prayer that, that is aligned with your own spiritual worldview. And I'll say, you already heard me say a little bit of it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Enjoying one moment at a time, living one day at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, uh, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you in the next. One of my favorite prayers. It's good for mm. everybody. Great for leaders. Wow. Well, we'll leave it there. Ian Morgan Crime, right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. We'll link to everything in the show notes. People can find you at ianmorgancron.com. Make sure you check out the Typology podcast. And mm -hmm. uh, so excited for that. And do get a copy of The Road Back to You. It's a fantastic book. And uh, thank you so much, Ian. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before. <laughs>